three. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of uh, One Plus One, your place for inconvenient truth song and myth busting. On the program, we return to the topic, the subject of Israel and the Palestinian people, and on to discuss the horrific state of affairs and where do people power movements and the Palestine Solidarity Justice Movement go from here. We are joined by Dr. Richard Falk, or Professor Falk, who has been a lifelong uh, UN diplomat, uh, a teacher, an author, and, and an expert on international law. He's Professor Emeritus of International Law at Princeton University, and he was the UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in the Palestinian Territories Occupied since 1967, from March 2008 to May 8, 2014. And he's here... And yeah, and he's here with us to discuss all things Israel. First, uh, so first off, Dr. Falk, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come on the air today. It's my pleasure to be with you, and I look forward to our conversation. Likewise, likewise. And, you know, my first question, uh, you know, I was going, uh, you know, my first question was actually going to be about the, uh, what was actually going to be about the events before October 8th. But you know it's funny because I, I I was at a friend's place uh, <laughs> I was at a friend's place Saturday night we got to talking about Palestine because uh, be because you know I was because one of the music I was because one of the musics I was playing was a Palestinian DJ who was doing a live performance in, in you know in Gaza we got to talking a little bit about the situation right now and my friend who was more on the you know, Hamas should have never done their uh, October eighth uh, attack and so forth. And I, I know, it, I know exactly where he was coming from. But then when I tried to, you know, give a whole historical background about, well, you know, the Palestinians, you know, they're, you know, they're under, you know, they're under military occupation. They're, uh, Israel's been guilty of systemic human rights abuses. But he said, oh, come on, we can't, we can't, we can't talk about history. Uh, we, we should only be talking about what happened on October the eighth. But this is what October 7th. Let me correct you. Yes, it was yes. October. The Hamas attack was October 7th. The well, Israeli response began on October 8th. Well, thank, well, thank you so much for correcting me on that. So, so instead of talking about those offense, which, which I do want to get into, because I do have an interesting question to ask you about, uh, you know, about that. I do have, I think, I think we do have to begin with history. I think history did not begin on, October seventh, and, and and I think, in order to understand why the uh, you know why you know why some of the Palestinians feel they have to take up uh, military, uh, they have to take up arms in order to in order to stop the suffering of their people. I think we should be talking about history. So, so I wanted to ask you: Can you explain how Israel practices apartheid? And is uh, arguably uh, a settler colonial state. And my follow-up question to that is to talk about your own experiences visiting the occupied territories. Yes, well, those are uh, very uh, probing questions. Um, uh, the uh, determination that uh, Israel is a apartheid state that maintains a system of uh, racist domination uh, that South African leaders have called worse than anything that existed during the South African period of apartheid. Uh, and this uh, assessment has not only been uh, endorsed by uh, UN special rapporteurs like myself and Michael Link, but it has also been supported by mainstream human rights organizations like Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and the Israeli human rights uh, NGO Beth Salem. So there is a real consensus that the and supported by heavily documented reports, uh, the first of which I was actually the co-author of 
that was in 2017 that was commissioned by the Economic and Social uh, Commission for West Africa, which is part of the UN, mm -hmm. and was attacked by none other than Nikki Haley in the Security Council when she was uh, serving as uh, Donald Trump's ambassador back in 2017. But what I want to emphasize was that the allegations of apartheid have been documented by very mainstream uh, civil society organizations that have generally been supportive of Western perceptions of human rights. So they should be taken seriously. And what was disturbing to me was the fact that both mainstream media and the uh, supporter, the, the liberal democratic government supportive of Israel completely maintained silence in the face of this evidence, this damning evidence. And I completely agree with you that the context prior to the October 7th Hamas attack is absolutely critical for a uh, reasonable uh, understanding of the motivations for the attack and uh, why uh, it should have been anticipated, particularly because Israel had ample warning that this attack was coming. It's a lot of rather suspicious in one way that they may have let it happen in order to have a pretext for what's happened since October 8th, the day after, so to speak. But when you say that history needs to be taken into account, uh, I fully agree with you. But in most public discourse, uh, what is most relevant, I think, for a group better understanding of the present situation is the near-term historical developments. And I would emphasize not only apartheid, as you did, but also the fact that the government of uh, Netanyahu, the coalition government, was widely viewed, including in Washington, as the most extreme government that Israel had ever had. And what made it extreme was that it was not hiding its intentions to establish a so-called greater Israel that encompassed the occupied territories. So the very survival of the Palestinian prospect of self-determination was being threatened overtly prior to October 7th. And one way of understanding the degree that it was threatened was to look back at Netanyahu's speech at the UN General Assembly where he held before the uh, member delegates a map of what he called the New Middle East, which erased completely Palestine. So, so the Palestinians were erased in their own homeland, which is a fairly dramatic thing given their long-term uh, resistance to uh, this kind of abusive occupation. And so there were many reasons to view the Hamas attack on October 7th as an uh, expression of resistance and resistance against alien oppressive rule is quite legitimate under international law. 
What isn't legitimate about the Hamas attack were the various uh, un, not very compellingly verified allegations of uh, war crimes. The, Hamas did not have, even in a resistance mode, a legal foundation for committing uh, these alleged crimes of shooting civilian children. And uh, there were early allegations that were later withdrawn. So we need an independent investigation of what really happened on October 7th. And it's a great, I think, political mistake and misunderstanding uh, which is encouraged by the state propaganda in the West and Israel, of course, of reducing Hamas to a terrorist organization like uh, ISIS or Al-Qaeda. We have to remember that Hamas was elected uh, in 2006 in an internationally monitored free election. It was a political entity. You may not like it. You may think it's too uh, Islamic in its uh, orientation toward governance, but it does represent the legitimate governance structure that was selected in Gaza and is enjoys greater popularity by almost all independent reports than it had uh, before October 7th and, and is now uh, feared to be the most popular actor on the West Bank as well. And for this reason, it's not likely one will see elections on the West Bank and uh, Israel won't allow elections on, uh, in Gaza. So the this prehistory yes, because, uh, is essential uh, because it's important. I, I think it's it's important to clarify for our audience that uh, that Fatah, you know, historically known as the Palestine Liberation Organization, which is currently led by uh, by Abbas, um, a Mahmoud Abbas, is actually very unpopular across the occupied territories, and I would say arguably in, in, in the international Palestinian diaspora, because uh, be, be, because not only do they keep propping up the two-state delusion, which we'll get into, but also they, they have been acting as a colonial viceroy to the systemic human rights abuses, which you've outlined in the past, and which people say Israel engages in the crime of apartheid, they engage in crime against humanity, and the PLO is often used as the colonial viceroy to keep the uh, population uh, in line. Yes, ju just to reinforce what you said, when I was a uh, UN Special Rapporteur, I almost had more trouble with the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah than I did with Israel. Because they wow. they were they were so uh, threatened by Hamas that they that was their principal enemy at the time, and a part of the Palestinian tragedy is like unlike other anti-settler colonial movements, they haven't been as able to establish a coherent and legitimate representation on an international level. And of course, that's been manipulated by Israel and the West in order to have a much more pliable uh, Palestinian leadership and to deny the Palestinians uh, the benefits of a unified leadership. And as you know, Hamas itself was a creation of Israel back after the 67 war in order to undermine the legitimacy of the Arafat-led PLO, which did have a fairly high 
level of legitimacy. It was controversial in certain Palestinian circles and people like my friend Edward Said were critical of the degree to which it placed trust in Washington as an uh, honest broker. Uh, that whole uh, illusion that the U.S. would uh, ensure a fair political compromise is really part of what has played into the Palestinian tragedy that has unfolded over all these years, reaching this horrible climax since October 8th. In fact, actually, a very quick follow-up question to what you were saying about uh, Hamas. Now, I've I've heard from uh, the late John Pilger, God rest his soul, uh, that uh, that this that 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 the whole uh, Hamas does not recognize Israel's right to exist is actually huge propaganda. And apparently, there was an academic I can't remember his name, but he but but there was an academic who actually has interviewed and researched Hamas extensively. And actually, Hamas, as you say, you can disagree with them on on their political uh, Islam and, and you know and so forth and their, and their kind of right-wing approach to Islamic affairs but in but actually Hamas actually does recognize Israel's right to exist and they even have flirted with the idea of a two-state solution on top of that they actually would like a 10-year ceasefire with Israel just so that they can negotiate how such a such a state or such a two state solution can actually look like, and I, I so, so I, I I wanted your response to that. Uh, it, it, like, is there a, is there any truth to that? Or, yeah, yes, there is. Though I would present a slight variation to what you said. I also had the opportunity to meet with uh, several Hamas leaders while I was special rapporteur both in Gaza and in uh, uh, in uh, Doha, in uh, Qatar, and in Cairo. And these the ones outside uh, Gaza were particularly influential and impressive intellectually, I found. And what Michelle, who was at that time the most uh, respected of the Hamas leaders and very close to the emir of uh, Qatar, he, uh, I had a long conversation with him and he was stressing the fact that Hamas was really seeking by backdoor diplomacy in Washington and elsewhere a 50-year uh, ceasefire, but uh, he indi- he didn't indicate a willingness to recognize the legitimacy of Israel. But a fifty year a lot can happen in fifty years, and he took the further position, which I found uh, compelling, especially in retrospect. He said that if uh, he tried to persuade people in Washington. If this wasn't uh, enacted, it would lead to tragedy for both peoples. Uh, he he had a ve- uh, you know very uh, uh, sensitive and wide ranging appreciation. Uh, the, Ma- the Marzuki, the uh, individual, the Hamas leader in uh, Cairo, who had, of all things, a PhD from LSU in the U.S. on barcodes uh, uh, and was interesting in a different way, but reinforced this essential message and talked about a long-time ceasefire, but but also refrained at that point. That was about 2011, 12, 2000, that period, refrained from uh, a willingness to 
uh, proclaim the legitimacy of the state of Israel, a long-term truce, an accommodation based on de facto uh, two states. See, it, it, at, at that stage, one doesn't know what would have happened during the 50-year period, but at that stage, what they were proposing is the establishment of this de facto uh, two states without getting into the moral, political, historical question of whether it was two legitimate states or one legitimate and one illegitimate. You know, they did, they avoid they thought it. Uh, well, that's, what, well, that's, well, that, that, that's what that's what a wonderful 50 year ceasefire negotiations would have <laughs> yeah. but then, that's fascinating but then I but, but then but then I have to ask this and this uh, but then I have to ask this question which is the um, the acts of Palestinian resistance that happened on uh, October the 7th and now I'm I'm not going to I'm not going to lecture how Palestinians should be resisting, whether it should be nonviolent, whether whether it should be violent means, that's all on the Palestinians. I, you know, I as a journalist who, who you know who advocates for the Palestinian people, I can only try to do what I do, which is try to inform people, try to decolonize people's minds, and get people to be involved in the global BDS movement and advocate for a democratic, secular, one-state solution, but. But that being said, given all you've just said, do you think that that the fact that there was very popular protests against the uh, current Netanyahu far right uh, coalition, given that there was a lot of uh, people power movement going on in Israel against his very unpopular administration and what they were going to do with the you know with the Supreme Court and the you know judiciary affairs. Do you think that the Palestinian that that the Palestinian attack or Hamas attack, however folks want to phrase it, has you know was counterproductive in that now you have an Israeli population which is more or less I think united behind uh, Netanyahu and 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 basically wants to you know, vanquish, you know, the palace, uh, not, not just Palestinian resistance, but I think arguably wants to even, wants to even end the Palestinians as a people and launch this greater Israel project. I'm curious, I'm, I'm curious your response to that. Well, uh, I, uh, what shall I say to that? I mean, I think it's, it's not clear at least from my experience, which now goes back almost a decade, uh, that um, Hamas was ready to uh, coexist in that way uh, with, uh, with Israel. And you should remember that the Israeli uh, tensions after this Netanyahu extremist government took power was almost exclusively intra-Jewish. Uh, it, it really didn't address, there was enough of an overlapping consensus among the antagonistic uh, forces, which were uh, could be characterized as extreme um religious zionism versus secular zionism but in both camps there was a uh willingness uh, to employ very uh, harsh methods to suppress the palestinian struggle for self determination and no uh influential uh, evidence that Israel was prepared to uh, negotiate a re uh, a outcome that could be viewed as reasonable from a Palestinian perspective. So I don't I don't think 
Palestinians can take much uh, hope from that early period. Now, it may be in light of what's happened in Gaza and the decline of Israel's global reputation and maybe uh, some heightening of global initiatives similar to what uh, brought uh, the South African apartheid regime to transform itself, that maybe there will emerge now a more uh, constructive Israeli perspective. I don't see the evidence yet to support such an uh, outcome. And I think, though, the best that can be hoped for in the short run is this kind of uh, de facto uh, separation that gives the occupied territories back to the Palestinian people. And that's, you know, the second uh, case that's now before the International Court of Justice, whether pro this prolonged occupation is sufficiently unlawful that it should be voided and Israel compelled to withdraw, which it was sort of expected to do way back in 1967. That's fascinating. And that's sort of uh, that's that's actually a perfect segue to this question, uh, to, to this question of mine, which is, uh, are we at a which is are we at a turning point in international affairs? At least, uh, may, uh, yeah. Are we at a turning point in international affairs in which we will see more countries engage in boycott, divestment and sanctions on uh, Israel? And with that, more room that we can advocate for a democratic one-state secular state solution as opposed to the two-state solution, which I reject. But even if one is still uh, an advocate of it, it's a delusion because Israel continues to – Israel has always been, been, been putting illegal settlements in the West Bank, in Gaza – in East Jerusalem, and even and and and, and as you mentioned, many of the supposedly secular, liberal, socialist Zionists in Israel, you know, they talk about a two-state solution, but they don't want to give up their illegal settlements in you know in the West Bank or 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 East, or, uh, East Jerusalem. So you're no, I, uh, I absolutely agree with you, and uh, to the extent that. Israelis and what I would call soft Zionists uh, support a two-state solution. It's always with the qualification that the Palestinian state should be demilitarized and therefore completely vulnerable to uh, Israeli uh, ambitions and policies and based on experience, you'd have to be crazy to trust Israel in s such a situation. They have to. Any solution that emerges that will be, will be that can s hope to sustain peace has to be based on the equality of the two peoples and the equal dignity, the equal protection, and arguably, the Palestinians are much more in need of protection than are the Israelis, and uh, especially the Jewish Israelis. In fact, you know, and uh, you know, continuing on from that, you know, do you see international relations? Uh, do you see? Yeah, do you see in international relations a seismic shift that will see governments across West Asia? the global south africa asia the americas engage in bds and more global demand for the one democratic secular state solution while it's, you know while the west will you know while the west will keep foolishly propping up uh, the uh, two state delusion well uh i do see uh at least in the immediate future 
a uh, intensification of support for a variety of uh, global solidarity initiatives, including BDS. And I think that will have some effect. It's hard to know exactly what effect, but it will be important. And uh, uh, I think whether, see, I think on the issue of what what the best solution is, the Palestinians have suffered by others telling them what their best solution is, including the UN, including uh, the West, the, especially the US. And I think my experience with uh, Palestinian uh, leading intellectuals and others recently is that they have a strong sense, whatever their differences, that they want to control what happens the day after. They don't want to be told what's best for them, like little children. And so in your advocacy of one, one secular state based on the equality of the two peoples, which was Edward Said's uh, preference as well, uh, I think you have to leave space, political space, for Palestinian agency. They can, it can't be a kind of told to them, this is what you should do. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, the, I think that's been a, a, a kind of Orientalist mistake from the outset often well-intentioned and uh, uh, I think take in, in this instance, taking account of the non-viability of the two-state solution given the settlement phenomenon and you know, there's 700,000 or more settlers in the West Bank alone, not counting the ones in East uh, Jerusalem and uh, they're talking, of course, I don't think it will happen. They're talking about resettle, reestablishing the settlements in Gaza. But, uh, but the, uh, I think the respect, we, I just participated in a conference in London on stopping the genocide in Gaza that I co-organized with the former prime minister of Turkey. And uh, that was definitely a theme of the Palestinian participants in that conference, that they didn't want to be told what was best for them. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. And a follow-up question to that is, why do you think... Uh, so much of the world, uh, which has an anti-Zionist uh, electorate, um, uh, that much of the heads of states and parties don't, uh, you know, engage in the BDS towards uh, Israel, or even at the very least, at the very least, an arms embargo on Israel. Well, I, th I think it's partly a reflection of the degree to which after the Cold War and the implosion of the Soviet Union, uh, the U.S. filled the geopolitical vacuum and has these 800 foreign bases all over the world. So these governments all or mostly with uh, huge public debt issues in their own country weren't prepared to lock horns with uh, the international financial system controlled by the West and especially mm -hmm. the US. Yeah. And whether that whether the moral outrage of their population is enough to shift this uh, caution about uh, taking controversial positions, in that sense, the South African initiative at the World Court was very important and has been followed by Nicaragua and Chile 
yeah. oddly enough, Latin American countries and uh, some Algeria and uh, other, there's a greater willingness, partly because of pressure from below, for, for, uh, grassroots pressure, these demonst large demonstrations all over the world, yeah. there's greater political costs in not supporting Palestine and greater political benefits to these national governments from supporting uh, Palestine. And that's part of what uh, led to the changes in the uh, balance of power on the South African issues, because uh, as you may remember, uh, South Africa was looked upon as a strategic ally of uh, the UK and US particularly in the Cold War era. And so that those uh, strategic postures were overcome by the anti-apartheid movement. And so that one can learn a lot, in my view, uh, from the anti-apartheid movement as it unfolded in South Africa. I was quite involved with that before I got into this uh, Palestinian-Israel uh, conflict. And my own political prehistory was started with the Vietnam, opposing the Vietnam War. And then uh, my interest in the Iranian revolution of 78, 79, and, and at the same time, the uh, South African issues, and finally, Israel. I'd stayed away from Israel-Palestine for years because I knew it was a red line in American political uh, <laughs> yes, behavior. Yes, exactly, exactly. I mean, we... we... We still get called. Uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, even 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 if your even if your background is Jewish, you will still be slandered, tarred and feathered, and being called an anti-Semite, or if not that, this ridiculous phrase of self-hating uh, Jew and so forth. So no, I'm... that was my experience. Uh, and... I am, I have a kind of secular Jewish, not very uh, observant, but uh, a secular New York City. Uh, background and uh, in a family that was sort of post-religious in their outlook. But uh, nevertheless, um, to the extent I had a distinct identity, it was as Jew. And I, I was attacked during the time, especially during the time I served at the UN as a self-hating Jew and as, as uh, a notorious notorious anti-Semite. One year, the Holocaust Institute uh, he, here in Los Angeles listed me as the third most dangerous anti-Semite in the world. And the first two were the uh, supreme leader of Iran and uh, the prime minister of Turkey. So I knew I was doing good job. <laughs> Well, I, I find that hilarious given that Turkey has very, for the most part, has very good relations with uh, with uh, Israel. But that's, I, I I just find that astonishing. But then, um, that's a perfect segue, actually, to these two questions, which is, do you think much of the liberal and center-left social democratic parties should and must pay an electoral price for their complicity in the suffering of Palestinian uh, people. And what do you and what will it take for the West and all of our leaders across the political spectrum to pay an electoral price for endless suff for for the endless suffering they've been complicit in Palestinian affairs? I, I really think it will take a upsurge of commitment. Uh, in civil society. Already you have a split in the uh, Western 
settler colonial countries like the US and Canada, Australia, New Zealand, yep. and the former colonial powers, the UK, France. And in a, in a certain sense, one can view this conflict that has reached such a horrendous level in Gaza as an enactment of the sort of inter-civilizational war that uh, Samuel Huntington anticipated at the end of the Cold War. You remember he talked about the clash of civilizations uh, at that time. He was a little ahead of his time, but we're heading in that direction because all the countries that supported Israel in the West were of this, had either a colonial or settler colonial past. And those that supported the Palestinians were either Islamic in their identities or victims of alternate colonial uh, subjugation. So I think that's important. Another factor in the question you uh, questions you've you posed just now and previously is that even before this explosion in Gaza, there was a increasing uh, discomfort, let me put it that way, geopolitical discomfort from the way in which the US was projecting its power all over the world and trying to be the only country that can use force outside its borders. This surfaced with the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine and in relation to the effort to keep China from uh, yeah. challenging the arrangements at ta in Taiwan. Yeah, so and it's Asia. And the formation of the BRICS, you know, the Brazil, uh, Russia, China, South Africa uh, uh, coalition, which was, which is threatening to the primacy of the dollar as the exchange currency. And that would create a much more um, diverse and balanced global system. And it might uh, actually marginalize the UN to an even greater extent than it was marginalized now. It can't function uh, constructively so long as it has the veto in the Security Council, which in effect says that the most powerful and dangerous countries in the world don't have to obey international law. And only the, uh, the mice, not the tigers, are accountable to the UN Charter. That's also with all also with their heavy stockpiles of nuclear weapons. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, those amongst, are the, amongst those other are the, amongst other WMDs. Yeah, and and the fact that they after World War II, one of the worst crimes was the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and it was given impunity. It was not. Uh, only the crimes of the losers were investigated and punished. See, and that was then built into the way the UN functioned, was designed to function, which is to ensure the primacy of geopolitics, taking precedence over law, morality, and the UN Charter. Yes, well, I, I, one can only hope that with more voices of reasons like Alina Duhan, formerly uh, uh, my friend, uh, Alf, uh, you know, Dr. Alfred Desaias, and hopefully more vo more voices of reason such as yourself and, you know, and, and people who aspire to want to have a career in the UN, hopefully they 
they, you know, they will use their voice to be advocating that we that the UN needs serious radical reforms if it if it even wants to be still seen as a legitimate force for international uh, affairs because. No. Because I think right now the UN is definitely under a heavy threat of being seen as illegitimate. And I believe more in reforming the UN as opposed to just, you know, not engaging with the UN because I still think that there's a lot, uh, you know, in the, you know, that the UN can, you know, be a force for good. No, I've, th I've just finished a book arguing just what you were saying will be published by Stanford in a couple of months i think i it's wow, a collaborative you, well, well, yeah, what go ahead. go ahead go ahead go ahead it's a collaborative book with a former uh under uh, assistant secretary general of the un a german uh un civil servant and i think uh, the title of the book is liberating the un uh, realism with hope well, we're going to have to get you and your co-author uh, back on the program in a couple of months once that book is released. But then, I have, to, but then I have to ask, uh, this is my uh, second to last question. I have to ask this then, which is, uh, which is, uh, you know, we've been talking about apartheid. We've been talking about settler uh, colonialism and how to mobilize justice for, uh, you know, for a, you know, you know, for the Palestinians. But I have to ask this question, which is, uh, be, be, because you're from because you're from the U.S. and you're based in the U.S., what do you think it's going to take for the American people power movements from the Black left, the Latinx left, to the workers' rights movements, environmental and green groups, to feminist, queer liberationists, racial and social justice groups, and the peace movement and the anti-imperialist movement and Palestine justice groups to show more urgent solidarity to the plight of Native Americans, Indigenous Alaskans, and Indigenous uh, Hawaiians. I'm 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 curious your response to that. No, I think the only hope is uh, just along the lines you suggested, a greater commitment across uh, what that what uh, social scientists call intersectional uh, interests and. Uh, uh, a recognition uh, that uh, the future of uh, anti-racism is tied to the liberation of the Palestinian people and to decent uh, treatment of indigenous Americans and poor, you know, ex people that are enduring extreme poverty while the one percent are absurdly rich. You know, I can in my own lifetime, uh, the middle classes have a much harder time living a decent life than when the economy was much smaller. So something's wrong with the distribution. As w when the economy expands, you at least expect everyone. To all levels to to some degree benefit but actually the ultra rich have benefited and the poor and the middle classes have actually contracted and making that message clear see in washington is out of touch with the citizenry which has uh led i mean it's uh clear in relation to the ongoing genocide in Gaza, where a large majority of the citizenry favor a permanent ceasefire, whereas the government in Congress and the White House are continue with this active complicity in the actual perpetration of genocide. So it's uh, until that, until politicians feel they have something to lose by continuing to support these regressive policies, I don't think things will change because uh, the, the Zionist project is 
supported by a lot of donor leverage in the uh, uh, diaspora, the Jewish diaspora, and it's very well organized. And the Palestinians are not, they don't create a balance so politicians feel they have something to gain politically by supporting a just solution for Israel-Palestine. So that that's where civil society has both the opportunity and the responsibility. And I hope that it will discharge, recognize the opportunity and live up to the responsibility. Yeah, here's and, and here's also hoping I've 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 seen lots of uh, protests in Australia, in New Zealand, in Canada, and yours truly, the United States, where lots of indigenous people have been leading protests or have or, or have participated in these historic, unprecedented Palestine justice programs. So, so here's hoping, you know, folks who meet, you know, indigenous uh, voices there will be much more conscious and then, you know, start to act uh, in, you know, you know, start to engage in solidarity work with the plight of Native Americans, indigenous Hawaiians, Native Alaskans, as well as uh, Aboriginal and, and, and Torres Strait Islanders from Australia and other Indigenous people from the Sami and uh, whatnot. So, so here's yeah. Some, I mean, that. I think that's begin. That's certainly beginning to happen. One has to be on guard, not get too fragmented, because that's a danger too. You, one needs to focus on certain priorities at certain times without forgetting uh, the needs of others. But yeah. Because if you try to do everything at once, you may end up doing very little. I'll I'll make sure to keep that in mind. Although I'm a big believer <laughs> that we can that we can chew gum and walk at the same time, that we can slay three evils with one AR uh with one AK forty seven. Well, Dr. Falk, just before I let you go, we usually end the program with the questionnaire that was done by uh, Marcel Proust, later French, popular French broadcaster, Bernard Pivon, and later my hero, James Lipton, the late, great James Lipton of Inside the Actor Studio. It's your turn to do this before I let you enjoy the rest of your Thursday. Uh, so here it goes. So, uh, so Dr. Falk, what is your favorite word? My favorite word, that's um, justice. What is your least favorite word then? Uh, genocide. What turns you uh, on emotionally, psychologically, or spiritually? Uh, love and beauty. All right. Then, then, then what turns you off then? Um, indifference and despair. Fantastic. Th then, what sound or noise do you love? What? What? I mean, uh, uh, what? What sound or noise do you love? Uh, many genre of music. Fantastic. Then, 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 what sound or noise do you dislike? Then. <laughs> um. Too loud conversations in restaurants. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I completely agree with you on that. And what uh, what is your favorite curse word? My favorite curse word is uh, I suppose. I suppose I don't have a favorite. Not uh, not 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 even the famous f bomb. <laughs> What? Yeah. <laughs> not 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 even the famous f bomb, the famous f word. Uh, not really. I mean, because they've become so prevalent that they don't even seem like curse words. Fucking shit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they, that's, true, been, that's true. That's true. been normalized. Much, they, they lose its magic. So they've been normalized in the language. I think. Well. Heaven forbid, uh, he heaven forbid, our political leaders start to engage in that work. Because then, I mean, even though I'm, uh, even though I'm, I'm for it, but then, but then it'll, it'll really go to show you how how much of a civilizational downgrade, you know, the state of affairs will be. Well, of course, Trump 
uh, has talked about shithole countries. You remember? Yes, yes, yes. That is true. <laughs> I believe he did. And I, I believe. I believe he. I believe he did once uh, drop an f bomb when he was saying yes. that. Uh, Listen, you mother effers! Like we're going to. You know, anywho. <laughs> <laughs> that what profession if you weren't doing uh the wonderful academia lecturing you do writing books uh, av uh and, and advocacy for oppressed people so if you weren't doing that what would you you know you know what, what would you love to uh, attempt to do uh either uh be a poet or a professional chess player Oh, fantastic. And what profession would you absolutely not want to do under any circumstances, Len? Corporate. Anything in the corporate world. Yeah. Likewise. Yeah. And, <laughs> <laughs> and finally, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say as you arrive at the pearly gates? And even if you're an atheist or, ag or, or agnostic, please uh, answer this question. Uh, welcome. Just, just a simple welcome? Yeah, that's all I expect. All righty, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, I, I'd say that's uh, more than I deserve and all that I expect or hope for. All righty, well, I'm, 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 well, I'm, 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 I'm sure you know. I'm, I'm, I'm sure when the time comes, you will be <laughs> welcomed with the open arms for all the good work that you do. Well, we were joined on this edition of One Plus One with uh, Dr. Richard Falk or uh, Professor Falk, who has been a lifelong UN diplomat, teacher, author, and expert on international law. He is Professor Emeritus of International Law at Princeton University, and he was the UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in the Palestinian Territories Occupied since 1967. Folks can check out his, uh, his latest writings and more at his own website, Dr. Falk, thank you so much for taking uh, the time out of your busy schedule uh, to come on One Plus One. I hope uh, we will definitely remain in touch. I hope to have you back yeah. on as a regular, especially with the new book you have come out. And please keep up the great work you do and power to the people and uh, death to settler colonialism. <laughs> well, thank, thank you. I really enjoyed your animated conversational skills that <laughs> <laughs> made a, made this a very lively discussion. Thank you very much for so that. Thank you very much for that. That's that's wonderful.